Welcome to a very special episode of Power Athlete Radio. This episode is important because we got to interview a legend and pillar in the strength game, Louis Simmons from Westside Barbell. This episode is important to me personally, as I knew Louis as a friend and mentor, having first heard his name in the infamous Westside Barbell as a 14-year-old kid reading Powerlifting USA magazines in Zangus' garage. What makes this podcast extremely impactful is the recent passing of Louis Simmons on March 24th at the tender age of 74. Anyone that knew Lou knows he lived his life with his foot firmly smashed on the skinny pedal. We are honored to have done this last interview with him in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks to Tom and the crew at Westside Barbell for making it happen. Without their help and stewardship, we would never have gotten this opportunity. So, my only advice, strap in. Hey, welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. We are on location in the beautiful Columbus, Ohio, with our good friend Louis Simmons here at Westside Barbell. So, Mr. Simmons, how are you doing? Good to see you again, my friend. How are you? It's been a long time. It has. uh, Way too long. Yeah. Um, I did uh, definitely enjoy a lot of my time here, and a lot of the stuff that I learned from you, I still put into practice daily. Hmm. So, yeah, thanks for coming on Power Athlete Radio. Yeah. Yeah. Louis, thank you. We had a couple trips. I was with John 2015, but there was a first trip. I think that's an excellent way for us to start out when John first came out to Westside. Yeah, no, it was great. Um, at the time, I remember you called me on the phone because you were interested in putting a certification together. And mm-hmm. you asked me if I wanted to sit on the board uh, you know, for your certification. And I was, of course. And then you said, hey, why don't you come out? And I came out for a couple of weeks and got to hang out. And it was, uh, it was eye-opening, to say the least. Huh. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, you, know, you walk in into, into that environment. Uh, I remember walking in the first day and it was like gangster rap at 10. I mean, dude, there was probably about 2,300 pound dudes that were probably not over five, five. I've never seen that many big dudes since I left the NFL. So it was, uh, definitely a exciting environment to go into. Yeah. Not environments a lot. Well, I'm always, uh, uh, like, and I told these guys when we showed up and Charles had never been here before, but we pull into West side, you know, here on industrial, it's in an industrial complex. Mm-hmm. You walk in, it's two bays. And I think people walk in and they sometimes think, you know, West Side Barbell, they probably heard the legends, you know. I mean, people always say, the you know, world famous, but I always call it the world the most infamous gym <laughs> in the world. And uh, it's in two bays and you walk in and it's, uh, you know, packed with equipment and, and uh, you know, strongest people in the world. Bad performance. We broke about 15 all-time world records last year. So, you know, everybody talks, but we walk. We mm-hmm. walk it and they talk it. They got all kind of gimmicks, and they never go to meets, and you know, but I don't even get on the internet. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's just a, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you've been, you've been dealing with hate on Westside Barbell for yeah, since day one. Yeah, no, it don't bother me. You know, there's a saying that uh, wolves don't hear sheep cry, and I don't. So when you know a bunch of people like that to me are just bitches, and that's all they're ever going to be. They're born that way; they're going to die that way. They say old men setting their ways is not really true. They're setting their ways around young men, and then they become old men. It just gets worse. Well, I mean, uh, they don't want to learn. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the idea, right? Like you have to be in this constant state of growth, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, not a fixed mindset. Right. And I think for you, I mean, you've never had a fixed mindset, and that you were always constantly looking for different ways to increase performance, and right. uh, you know, uh, to kind of increase the total. Yeah, I, I mean, I have fourteen, you know, United States and European patents. And it's all geared to either uh, prevention of injury or making you stronger. You try our MR19 down there. It's a machine you slide up and down. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, that thing it, is, it looked like a reverse frog squad almost. Yeah. That thing is real. You won't believe what it will do for sprinting or, or lifting. It's unbelievable. Yeah. We just had 50 pounds on there and we're still. My girl was it. using 125 this morning. I got, I got, I need another crack at it then. Yeah. She had a hundred reps with no weight on, on it. Hard to get all the way down. But we train so much hip. A lot of hip, hip, hip. You know, that's all we do. Not all we do, but primarily what we do. We, we didn't, I don't know what you want to lead into, but we're do, we do a lot of jumps. So we're doing depth jumps off a 20 inch box and she constantly made progress. And then we did depth jumps off of uh, depth drops off a 60 inch box. And it would take about two weeks to see any improvement in the jumping. So we decided we just hit her hips. So we hit her hips for nine weeks, and she came in, she broke her, her you know, touch record by three inches by not doing any jumps, by just concentrating on the muscles. That's always been my theory. Just make the muscles strong. If you're an athlete, you're an athlete. If you're not, you're not, you know. Hey, Power Athlete Nation. 
I need to take a few moments to thank our sponsor, Power Athlete Training Systems, for providing the best training programs on the universe, in the universe, in the metaverse. I mean, really, if this is the matrix, and I'm pretty sure we're stuck in the matrix, Neo and Morpheus are uploading Power Athlete Training Systems. I'm pretty sure they're doing field strong. What do you think, McCorkle? Oh, I agree. They are on a specific training program for what they need. And to find out what you need, listeners, head to powerathletehq.com forward slash training and take our little survey to find the perfect training program for you. So we have developed training programs specific for an archetype. You want to get jacked, we got Jack Street. If you're looking to foster and develop athleticism, we got Field Strong. If you're looking to kick the door off of hinges and smash things and cut up and just be a fucking badass, we got Hammer. If you're first experience in terms of lifting weights and getting used to a barbell using a basic linear progression with bedrock that's the right one for you and if you have a few miles underneath your belt maybe a few kids fortune 500 ceo or maybe life's getting a little in the way i want you to check out grindstone and if your job and your desire is to fucking wad your face off i want you to go check out johnny wad and if you want to stack on a little johnny bot on that hit a little bodybuilding accessory we got that too So what we've done is we've created this amazing catalog of services, these training programs designed for archetypes, and every one of them fits a specific user. And you know what? If you want to find that user, go on. I want you to take the survey, and then I want you to click on and take our seven-day free trial and see which one is right for you. Best-in-class training. And for less than a dollar a day, you Mm. get it delivered straight to the mobile app Train Heroic. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you want to sign up for our newsletter, you can go to powerathletehq.com forward slash or backslash forward slash forward slash newsletter. I want you to go to that, sign up for the newsletter. where you can get more information, not only on training programs, get uh, discounts on shop on the merch, and really just know what's going on within Power Athlete with the Academy and some of our other initiatives. And the latest episodes of Power Athlete Radio. Which is really the most important thing. Power Athlete Radio the premier podcast in strength conditioning and your resource for the best information on training, nutrition, cars, maybe some movies, banter and banter. I mean, we've been on other fitness podcasts and when it comes to banter, we can fucking out banter anybody. Yes. And if you're a big fan of power at the radio, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. Hit us with a five star review that we will read. If you leave us an amazing five star review, we will read it on air. And believe me, I love reading the reviews, uh, especially the five-star ones, because it lets us know we're doing a good job. And we got some very creative listeners out there. We do. I mean, uh, that's why there are people. Yes. Throw your hat into the ring. Again, head to powerathletehq.com forward slash training for all your training needs. Take a little survey. Find out what you're training for. Seven-day free trial on that program and training for less than $1. Thanks to Power Athlete Radio for sponsoring this podcast. <laughs> See ya. Bye. It's it's interesting. Like uh, there's so much confusion when you talk about like uh, athletic form of training and uh, you know bodybuilding and all these people are trying to hybrid this stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, it goes back to generating force. I remember uh, you know when I you know walked into your place years ago and we were talking about uh, you know Fred Hatfield compensatory acceleration. I mean, I was 14 years old training in George Zangus's garage with him telling me about compensatory acceleration the idea is mechanical advantage increases so does bar speed you know like when i would go punch try to punch three you know three to six inches through the individual you know finish everything violent hip extension and uh you know that was the the garage i grew up in and um you know and i remember i mean i I know you know the story george had one of your first prototypes in the reverse hyper yeah and so uh you know it was uh, like it just seemed yeah it was quite too right yeah yeah it was uh, a marathon yeah i remember (laughs) yeah and we had uh, uh Start. yeah they were shitty oh no kidding yeah they were awful they uh it was the best at the time well they had seams and the problem is when you put them on and you would squat the, you would basically get like the skin would rip wherever the seams were so you take your, your squat suit off and you'd fucking be bleeding <laughs> and you're going like did that thing give me 20 pounds <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that that's what was so impressive when you see that's like uh, nice. Fred Hatfield squatting what a thousand thirty seven or something in George's suit, and he probably had twenty pounds of carryover. Yeah, know? yeah. I talked about uh, I talk about cat a lot, and compensatory acceleration training, and and it, it, it in theory it's good, but with lighter weights you must use bands. You had to must accommodate resistance with it, because at the top you're not producing any force. You know, at the end of your punch you have zero. 
In Olympic lifting, the, the force is diminished from the first pull. At the second pull, the bar slows down to zero, and that's where it has the least amount of force. You know, yeah, that's a tricky sport. You know, it looks different than it's not really cracked up what it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, I mean, the uh, accommodating resistance was really interesting because uh, as you got stronger, I mean, teaching people compensatory acceleration only takes them so far. Well, like once you get to a point, you have to use accommodating resistance. Right, exactly. So that as you're speeding it up, you actually have some form of force. And like, you know, using the bands of the chains, um, you know. Yeah, and the bands were so good over chains because it, it produced the overspeed of centrics and was for greater stretch reflex. I, uh, the Dr. Siff, when he was alive, you know, I did seminars with him. And we, I had him convinced that I could override the goji tendon by using an enormous amount of band. And because, you know, you take weights, you get crushed on the bottom sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. None of my guys have ever got crushed with bands. You know, bands and weights. They'll at least, start, I mean, they hardly ever miss, but I've never seen them not start back up. It will, it's an opposite and equal effect. Mm -hmm. If you put like 700 pound of band on there, you're going to exert immediately, your body will want to resist to that back in, in the opposite direction. And uh, he died. <laughs> and I've never got anyone to come here and test any of the things I do. And I've done a lot that they've never done. Do you think that the, uh, I mean, obviously the bands are dramatically better than the chains, or do the chains have a place in the, in the yeah, hierarchy? Bands, I like chains. A band, you know, no matter what, a band is so much for you, any kind of band, so much for me. But we would, me and you could never train together because all the chain would be on the ground when I sit down. Hmm. That's one problem. You know, it's it, it too unregulated. Bands doesn't matter. They're constant. You know, um, you know light band, medium band, green band. Double green bands, you know, we, oh, we use a lot of band. And that's how vocal bull got so strong. I mean, he's got 11, 1180 weighing 264. So it, it did it, but all the over, oh, the heavy amount of band, super maximal at the top, over, over speed of century. So that's how we did it. You know, uh, some I've told the, I've, I've told people for years when, uh, when I came out here and we were working on my squad. You made a, a funny statement, which I've taken. You said, hey, uh, you're, uh, one, you said your waist is too small. Oh. Uh, but you also said uh, you have good enough mobility to squat toes forward. And then when I asked you how come all your guys are squatting with their toes out, you said because their bellies are too fat, they can't get into the squat. But he said you get, or you were like, hey, your mobility is good. You need to go toes forward. And I've argued with people with this for years, like when you, you know, athleticism, movement, uh, playing football, I mean, that was my whole deal where, you know, constantly working on driving toes forward, putting a big toe on the ground, and being more violent. And you made a good point. You were like, you know, you should squat toes forward, unless you can't because you're too fat, and then you got to open your toes up. But Vogelpool did. Yeah, and and he he squatted with his toes out. I've had a couple of guys that could do it, but I mean, I could never do it or anything. And you know, so I'm always in arguments with football guys that are not for not too long though about squatting wide. So why would you, you don't play football out there? Have you ever watched the beginning of a football game when the camera's behind the, the punter and all the linemen got their god darn feet that wide? That's how you, the game, that's when they, we had three guys here at Ohio State in three years in a row, Terry Groin. They say they do all this flexibility work. I said, yeah, but you're, you're all weak. You know, the Boza brothers and then uh, Chase Young. Same injury. How do you get the same injury? That's not so good. Not when you're talking about what number one or two draft pick. Well, yeah. the uh, where people get wrapped around the axles, they start looking at flexibility in terms of passive, and it's really active range of motion. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I found to ever really train active range of motion was under some form of heavy weight. And I explained to somebody one time, like lifting weights is like stretching with heavy ass weight on your back and being able to move through full ranges of motion under load and do it violently. Mm -hmm. Like there's no replicating that. And all the fucking uh, rotational uh, yoga and all the other stretching bullshit passive that you do isn't going to make you strong in those range of motions that you need it when you're most, you know, like got to generate the most force. So I'm always amazed when I watch these guys do all this stretching. And I'm like, what is passive fucking stretching doing for you? I want to know why they stretch so long and they go on the field and get hurt. Like uh, what, uh, you know, a uh, Beckham or whatever in that game, he, he hurts his knee, there's no contact. And uh, but it, because they don't train their calves and hamstrings. Well, he tore his ACL. Yeah, yeah. but if you've got strong hamstrings and calves, you will not turn. Yeah. I got medical books that says you can play. I, I tore mine. Scored 920 pounds. I was 52. 
so I tore my ACL uh, sometime towards the end of my NFL career, and uh, we never even noticed. Yeah. It wasn't until I got my knee scoped, the doctor's like, you know, you don't have an ACL. And uh, he's like, I couldn't even tell you didn't have an ACL because your hamstrings were so thick. Exactly. Yeah. It's the key. But they, you know, you know, you're in this, you're in this. I don't, I, I write the books. I just write books and we, I stay down there. Uh, but you, you see, training is like waves, like the ocean. It seems like you got a wave of good training, then you got a wave of bad training. You know, no generation comes in. Right now, I've got to write an article. Tom wants me to write an article. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. My opinion on hit training. Because I know it sucks. And you know where hit training came from? I don't want to tell you a whole lot. Well, no, it. Uh, Arthur Jones. Yeah, well, Arthur Jones. But I mean, also, uh, um, Berkashansky uh, wrote about it in Super Training. I mean, they showed circuits and there was a GPP deal and Penn, base level of fitness. Penn State. Yeah, in Penn State. Oh, I Penn, mean, me, we just get into it all Oh, fuck. Yeah. Ask him about the one set to failure on the, on the hammer strength shit. I did uh, that okay. stuff. It was fucking awful. Yeah, well, that's, that's what he did. It, it wasn't a training method, it was a, a, a business uh, um, mode model. He's going to kick you in there, going to run you through all those machines and out the door, next guy in. Yep. And he did it by convincing you that Casey Viator and all these guys got that big doing it. Yeah. And I'm going, like, you're out of your mind. I've had pro bodybuilders there. I don't like to work with them, but they're way stronger than you think they are. Especially some in the bench and in the deadlift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, enormously strong. Yeah, I got to write about it. And it's, mm-hmm. You know, 20% of our training is only a barbell. Squat and bench, deadlift, good morning. 80% small exercise, concentrate on one particular muscle group. But you got to have one particular weakness. So we concentrate on that one particular weakness until it exceeds the next thing that we work on. That. Well, we never give anything up. We're constantly working on like lower back and hamstring and triceps and, you know, the essentials that make you live big weights. So how, I mean, um, you know, for people that have been living under a rock, that don't know about the West Side system. I mean, there's, I mean, can you get into a little bit of like uh, how it was created? I mean, I know that the system you created was in response to not only your own injuries and the people around you and trying to make the best training system, but there's also this misconception that it's just for geared powerlifting. No, it's for all sports. It's all, yeah. we, we, powerlifting's this big for us. All sports is gigantic. We're huge overseas. We're huge in South Korea, Korea for instance. You know, who would dream that? So big, you know, we have to do a lot of uh, trademark work and stuff. No, it's all sports. Um, the, um, Danny D. Pasquale with the Melbourne Storm kills him every year. Been doing this for years. And then um, uh, Phil, Phil uh, was it Phil somebody? He had the only team in the Premier League, 26 and 0, West Side Barbell. There's, he wrote two books about it. That's what I mean. See, then those books go away and people go, well, I never heard of it. Well, there it is, buddy. Well, I mean, even the influence in, uh, you know, the way I write stuff for Power Athlete comes from actually conversations we had where I remember you said, hey, I wouldn't train because uh, I was asking you about training football players and athletes. And you were like, um, on your max effort work, I want you to do threes and fives, you know, in, uh, you know, push out the rep maxes away from singles and start, you know, hitting a higher deal. And um, even on the compensatory acceleration, the speed work bringing that in and kind of a percentage of that. And uh, it's paid in great dividends for us. One thing we're done, we went to fives because my guys is too big of groups. And, hey, we're doing doubles, taking hours to do speed work. I'm going, this is ridiculous. We should do this stuff in 20 minutes. Yeah. We went to fives. And people have asked me why. But the reason is because we can move five as fast as two so we're putting out the same force, you know, that we were with two. So why not do it that way? And you're, you're, you're getting way better condition. And th- th- here's a, a, a thing I felt real strange about. Our guys, at, you know, at the end of the workout, when we're like 80, 85 percent, could do 15 reps. You can, people can't do that. You do doubles. They're like, you do three. We're doing 15 freaking reps. Then we go over and our do our 25 deadlifts. I said, it's all work capacity, buddy. If you ain't got work capacity, you have nothing. You know, you win everything at the end. All football, all sports are won at the end. Well, you got to be in shape enough and be durable enough to be able to survive the training to be able to get to game day. And the problem is, if you don't put yourself in that crucible, you're never going to have the capacity you need to be able to survive it. Right. You know, it's kind of like uh, people always ask, you know, hey, if, you know, like if I got injured, I was still able to play. I'm like, yeah, because I got a lot of muscle on me. And unfortunately, or fortunately, like that's allowed me to go do this stuff. Like, you know, like, I mean, shit, I saw your thing where it's like, you know, weak things don't break. 
I mean, I watched a million dudes shatter on the rocks just because they weren't physically strong or mentally strong because they didn't do the training to get themselves there. That's right. Yeah, you don't want to go somewhere you've never been every damn day of your life. You want to have already arrived there and just so where it's commonplace. Yeah, well, you, you never want to walk out on a Sunday and think the hardest work I'm ever going to do is on this day. Yeah. You need to be able to do the hardest work in training so that when you get there, you're like, oh, shit, now I can, you know, not relax a little bit, but believe me, it's not going to be as hard. Mm hmm you know, and I think what you've done a good job of is in the training environment here. When they probably go to the meet, it almost feels like a little bit of a vacation. Oh, meets are a joke to fair to hmm. the training is a joke. Uh, you know, you asked, you know, I, mean, I brought my lord back and I had a top toe in the world in 1973, 81. So what what was your first year powerlifting? I actually went to meet in 66, but then when I got out of the army in 70, I started full time. But in 73, I had the top toe in the world, the 181s. You know, I had 670 deadlift. I remember I told myself to come out to Toledo. No, there's no gear, zero. And I said, uh, my back's indestructible. Well, I broke it during good morning. I'm on crutches for 10 months. So I come out of there, and uh, I, I, that's how I invented reverse hyper. No one was going to fix me. I had to, you know, involve myself in my own therapy. So I did all that. Then 82, I break it again during 81. And I broke it again, and uh, I couldn't lay down for 17 weeks. All right, so meanwhile, I say, there's got to be a better way. So I bought all the Bud or Bud kind of and whatever, you know. And I remember he said, Louis, it said, these, uh, I don't think you want these. These are, uh, these are classroom books. I said, exactly what I want. I wonder what the hell I'm doing. Well, that's what changed it all. The management of training and the weightlifter was the first book I, that really helped me. It would make any weightlifter. And most weightlifters never heard the book. That's amazing. And then, uh, so I started doing it. Then I went to weight periodization. We've, where I go, uh, we, we uh, I won't confuse people. But okay, you should go 75, next week 80, next week 85, then you drop back. So you jump 5%, 5%, and you drop back 10% and start it over. And it, it goes continuous. Waves. Yeah, it's waves. It's waves. Yeah. You wave. You can't just keep going up. And that's where, you know, when you handle weights at 90% above and the same exercise for three weeks, you go, you, you go backwards. So that's how it all started. Then I just started breaking it down, you know, and I didn't realize I had to have certain machines. But the weight periodization made a, a huge difference in what we do. So, I mean, but you, uh, I remember sitting down with you and uh, going over the tonnage that I was lifting at the time. And you were like, dude, you're handling more tonnage and training than even our guys that are squatting 1,000 pounds and you're not squatting 1,000 pounds. Yeah. And I remember we ended up going back and like breaking it all down and being like, hey, this is how you wave. And it was uh, extremely impactful for me because I read your book. Uh, before I came out, and then uh, when I sat down with you, I realized that uh, what's written in the book for West Side Fundamentals and all that isn't what's at West Side, which is in here, in here in Columbus. So like that was cool to sit down and actually go over. And I'm like, well, that's not in the book. And you're like, not everything's in the book. You got to come to West Side to learn West Side. Well, you know, if that gentleman squats 400 pounds and he's on that mile lift over there, and you squat 800 pounds and you're training at 80 percent, the bar should be moving at the same rate of speed. It's all about velocity training. Weights aren't heavier, light. They're fast or slow. Yeah. That's, that's how they're measured. And so, again, when I learned that, when I got that in my head, I said, oh, this changes everything, you know? And uh, so that, that made a big difference. Just one thing, I just stacked. I kept reading what they were doing, and I said, they're out of their mind. Well, they weren't. You know, like, I never, how many reps you do with 80 or 90 percent? I'd do as many as I could. Or one. I never followed charts. That uh, Perlipin did, and he's one of the greatest coaches he ever had, with the strongest guys. So I started following all that stuff. I mean, then everybody got behind me, and then we just started blowing stuff up. We broke about 170, 75 world records. Nobody, there, I bet there's not four gyms in the country or even more could say they can do, they've done that. But we, this gym down here, and I'm having a hard, I got to buy lifters to come here. You know what I mean? It's hard to get lifters. And, but we're doing it. My girl, she just squatted 685 at 148. At 535 dead at 132, she's done. So it, it's all the same training. So um, how much of it is like uh, um, like the gear? Because uh, I remember the day I showed up, uh, we floor pressed. And I remember I floor pressed like 500. And I think AJ did 505. And those guys were all, we were all right around 495, 500. And I felt pretty good. And then the next week we came in, those guys threw their shirts on. And AJ did like a 9, 910, 920 bench off, of, or no, I think it was 940 off of a two or three board. 
And uh, he ended up bringing, like, it was 900 down to his chest. So, I mean, the fact that that shirt had, I mean, he was real good in the shirt. I mean, 400 pounds of carryover. Like, is that pretty consistent in terms of? Put the gear down. I, wrote, I just wrote a book, The Greatest of Their Times. You know, who's the greatest football player? They can't say Brady. You know, I mean, you just can't. No, it, it, it's era-based because that's the game right. did, it changes. Exactly. Uh, that's why I wrote this book. You know, ten, the 10 greatest of their time. And I remember when you put Brees on and you fucked up your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's you. Yeah. You are, man, I'll go like, look at this guy. Yeah. You know, I'll go, don't even touch me. Yeah. <laughs> well, were, yeah. I remember your man. I was get the hell with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, yeah, so he, he loaned me some briefs. And, uh, you know, so when you put the briefs on, the pressure mm -hmm. goes up. And all of a sudden, I, like, came off. And I came off so fast, I broke all the blood vessels in my eyes. And Louie was like, that's what I like to see, you know, like, like, it's, hey, just fucking go for it. And I'm like, you know, like, I mean, it's well, like if you put me in your Hellcat, I'm believe me, I'm not going to fucking not put my foot to the accelerator or yeah. to the floor. You, uh, you just asked a question that I've asked, I try to get people to come here. What is his strength with gear? You know, when you, you bench, like I got a guy, I mean, he, he's got a new shirt. He did, um, he can bench 515. All right, and he's Jack way more than I was. I did five fifteen, way into two, but he's been nine hundred ten pounds at eighty one. So what is that strength? Well, you, you, I mean, like you ever think about how would you hit if you didn't wear a helmet or didn't wear gear? It would something would change. Yeah. I don't know what. Well, it's well, not going to change what we're doing. Well, mm. but but think about this. I mean, the fact like. Like where I think people uh, fucking poo-hoo it, what they don't realize is the structure that you need within terms of like mm. bone density, ligament oh. thickness, all that other shit, just to be able to support. Like I saw the video of that dude uh, benching, what was it, 1322? 1320. I mean, his his bench, I mean, it's the biggest lift ever. I mean, nobody's ever squatted it that much. Broke his two record by 200, 200 pounds. pounds, right? I mean, and what was wild is... Um, uh, you know, and, and the, I, I was reading the comments and like people were like shit on this dude about it. It blew my fucking mind. I'm like, do you know the fucking physical strength, bone density, ligament, connective tissue just to be able to support 1300 pounds and then have the balls to put it over your face and bring it down? Fuck all of you for even the fact that you shit on this dude. I'm like, uh, uh, fucking take half of that out with that. I mean, it's it, like they I don't, fucking blows my mind. Well, I remember when I was just starting, I could be like 340. And I remember doing rag presses and, you know, just barely getting 500 off a pin. I'm going, now how in the world do these guys bench 500? Actually, that was a pretty good big bench in 1970, you know. I mean, Pat Casey's 617, but you're going like, I'm going, how they do it? It's about to go right through my little pissy hands. Yeah, like I said, it's normal stuff. Well, I mean, I, I benched, uh, I squatted 610 raw when I was 19. And then I benched 500 when I was 22. And uh, I remember you telling me, heavy dumbbells. You got to have dumbbells up to 180 if you want to bench 500. Yeah. And it was floor press and it was all this accessory work and triceps and heavy dips and all that. And uh, close grips. You know, the close grip was the single, what was the, was the, the driver for me. Widen it out an extra thumb uh, or thumb width and fucking 500 pounds straight off the chest. Uh, Rob Fusner said when we would use change, you know, before bands, he said, you know, because we do, we change our grips. said every time if you're going to take your grip out, it you need to set another set of chain on the bar. He, you know, really, he was right. Yeah. John, can you talk about the the phone call to help you bench 500 pounds? Yeah, so my um, my roommate Kevin Doherty had a bunch of your West Side videos, the VHSs, and we would watch them. And then at the very end, Louis would put his number, West Side Barbell. You call and Doris would answer the phone, huh. and then yell for Lou, and you come over. And uh, you, I mean, you've done this for years. Yeah. I mean, the amount of people that you've coached virtually on just on a phone call and help people. I mean, I can't imagine if all the people lined up outside that actually called that number and were blown away. You know, I remember Dora said, hello, you know, and uh, I mean, it, it, like that's, I think, what's so interesting is, um, I mean, you know, for probably I'm sure there's a bunch of people like oh, Louis Simmons is a fucking asshole. But the amount of people that you've helped without any. You know, like uh, at, like nothing in return yeah. other than use the training and fucking be a badass. Just, just break a record. That's all I ask. Just prove my method. That's all I've ever asked a person to do. So what are you? Break your record. That's all I ask. If you're not, you're. And if a guy comes here, you know, we bring him in, and he not he doesn't get any better. We know he he's no good. It's not it's not us. It's him. <laughs> well, and and and, and you've also. How many guys ever? We've got over 100, 800 squatters 
and 35 over 1,000. So people said one day, where's your scientific evidence on swirling? I said, where's yours? I said, you got 100 guys have, have, have officially squatted, you know, 800. No. Oh, we got the biggest wall squad in Vlad. Vlad squad 1157 trained here. 1157 wall. So, but to see things don't bother. It's not my job. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I mean the uh, the other big one too is, I mean, like the uh, idea of like uh, using the box squat in terms of like taking out the stretch shortening reflex and being able to drive off the box. Can you talk a little bit about like that in terms of the ability to generate force and what what that did for you guys as squatters? Well, it's everything. I mean, when I was fourteen, I was squatting four ten, clean jerk two sixty, weighing one forty to meet at fourteen. I mean, I was drawn a little bastard. And, but at 18, when I was getting, I went in the army, I was 410. I went nowhere. And I got in the army and uh, started reading Muscle Power Builder articles by, you know, Westside Barbell, Culver City. And I said, well, I got nothing to lose, nothing. So I started box squatting. Three months I took a squat, you know, all boxes, I squatted 450. And then, I mean, I went, I did a 665 roll in the 181. You know, two hour weigh in and no gear, no knee wraps, no nothing. So I was convinced, and everyone's ever come here, they all, I, mean, I, I told you, I said, Vogelpohl never did a full squad. Uh, AJ, uh, you know, I mean, uh, AJ never did one, 1210. Hoff, 1273. We never did, we never did, they didn't do any squat. They all box squat. I roll right out of them. Hell, if you can box squat, you can full squat. And uh, the th you know what I found too over the years, I don't really write about it like I was. I've been a little sick couple here for a little bit. But when you can use a box, um, you can control the eccentric phase. Yes, you will go a lot lower on a box than you ever would without the box. And uh, but you control that eccentric phase by setting on a box. So and you can set uh, we and Dave, we did experiments with Nintendo eccentric and concentric, and I could stay down with uh, well, it was 485 pounds and 375 a band. I could stay down on the box for eight seconds to get up to the same speed. And they asked me, well, what's the big deal? So what about football players? You guys are on that line for a long time. It maintains that. It, it won't maintain, uh, uh, you, you know, it, it, it remain, it's reversal strength, not plyometric. Because guys say, well, it will not do that. I said, I never said it would. You know, it's so funny how people know little but don't know much. <laughs> I didn't say it would, it's plyometric, because you know that's under two tenths of a second. But I mean, I remember Dave Tate was very powerful, you know, like extremely. He could sit down for five, I think, because his muscle fiber is different, than mine, you know. And uh, but I can sit down for eight and just same speed. He uh, he he told me that he was the fastest with the tendo, but yet did not have anywhere near the biggest squat. So therefore, the tendo was useless. Which uh, I love Dave's finality and everything because it didn't work for him. It must not work for anybody. Which <laughs> I, I mean, the tendo to me was a measuring tool, and that's all it was. Yeah. I mean, I know what you know. I can look at you and say, "Oh, you're, those are way too slow," you know, or they're way too fast. Yeah. I mean, so, if it's too fast, you should have more weight. That's right. Yeah. Good tool for the athlete to see the feedback. Well, we we were talking about uh, where people are looking for like velocity based training systems, and uh, when we did is um, the group of, of people that I was training with. I remember we had a group of about ten people, and we were using a tendo to try to figure out like our own kind of velocity curve, where you know certain people. And the problem is, it became like I had a, a girl who was uh, like a uh, what was she? she was like a Canadian sprinter, and uh, was an unbelievably uh, fucking very very twitchy. I mean, she was like our outlier, and then we had another people, and I tried to get like a huge cross section of athletes to see at which percentage of one RM they could move at which weight, and I ended up figuring out that like it was so dependent on the individual, and yet you could almost put them through a series of tests beforehand to kind of figure out where they were, like a uh, you know foot contact time, reaction, all the other stuff, jumping, and there were certain people that were just more twitchy than others, mm -hmm. and they were they were better, but it didn't necessarily mean I mean the strongest person we had, uh, to, you know their fucking squat took them ten seconds because they were so grind and slow and well, i'm sure you've seen that too well that's the old problem of progressive gradual overload and, you know that, that stuff just don't work and like you said weights get weights get bigger they slow down you know you're in a game and you can't slow down so everything i mean we, we you to lift the weight you've got so long to lift it if you don't make it a you know maybe two seconds or two and a half you, you miss so people say why speed well, one it develops a rate of force development 
A lot of people, like you said, they don't have that. That's what that develops. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, um, I mean, uh, uh, I think what's cool about the NFL and professional sports and Olympic sports is it's kind of like a, a you know, genetic. You kind of get to this point where it's like the you know genetic freaks, and I'm sure with powerlifting you've seen the same thing oh, where it's like. Problem. I mean, uh, you know, when you have uh, guys in there that are, you know, five, six, five, seven, three hundred plus pounds. I mean, there's not the average person's being able to handle that much and be able to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first time we came in to lift, I think it was Tony Baloney. Oh. Uh, I mean, shit, he put eleven hundred pounds and came off the bar so fast that I almost was like, holy shit. I mean, that I, I couldn't believe how fast that guy was off the box. Yeah, if we just had time to transfer that into football, but we don't. Yeah, because football is a major thing. You know, for you, for football players. Yeah. But I mean, wouldn't you imagine? Um, I mean, I, I would be really surprised if there was any football player that wasn't doing some form of speed work. I think. Uh, I mean, I uh, unfortunately I've been kind of clicking on Instagram, and there's a guy who who works with uh, allegedly a bunch of offensive linemen. I was kind of clicking through the workouts, and uh, you know, I'm always interested to know like what these guys are doing for their training, and more importantly, like there's really not very good at lifting weights. No. You know, it's so funny. They always, they kind of downgrade lifting weights. But what do you hear every? They got to get him in the weight room. And and if it wasn't for weights, you know, these string coaches wouldn't have jobs. Well, if it wasn't weights, I wouldn't have played in the NFL. Well, I mean, I, I I was six foot, one hundred sixty five pounds before I ever touched a weight, and uh, you know, and uh, like, I mean, I was fourteen years old Jeez. when I went in. I know crazy but I, I was telling him the story uh i was probably 10 years old maybe 11 and we were at the beach and this is in southern california where i grew up and uh, i was in this program called junior lifeguards which was like a prep program for lifeguards and it was some kids and you know 10 12 13 years old do and uh we were at the like the lifeguard station and uh like all of a sudden we kind of looked over and on the on the strand like the concrete where people ride their bikes and walk there was like a whole like mess of like noise we looked over and we thought it was like a riot or somebody had died or you know something like we could hear people yelling so we went over there to kind of see what it was and there was a guy walking down the boardwalk in a pair of shorts and a string tank top and his chest was so big you could put a drink on top <laughs> and this guy like we like saw him we're like and he kept walking past us and we started following him and then he started running because there was a big ramp up to the top where the parking was and he started running up and down it and uh i remember thinking like i want to lift weights and that guy was lyle alzado yeah, Jeez. yeah, and so I mean, played for the Oakland or uh, uh, Raiders. I mean, Lyle was a fucking monster, yeah, and really. I, I've never in my life ever seen anybody that well put together. Huh. I mean, and uh, it, like we didn't know who he was, and then all of a sudden we were telling you know my dad who it was, and turned on the TV, and we're like, oh, that was the guy we saw, huh. and he lived in our town. Wow, and uh, yeah, Lyle Ozeda was super impressive. He ended up about the Browns. Yeah, and I, my, they were called the Wild Bunch, and they said he was the craziest person they've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, he was a live wire. Out there. <laughs> yeah, he had a big gold chain. I mean, his chest, I just remember like like this big. Like you could have put a drink right on top of his chest. He was a fucking monster. Huh. And I remember thinking like, I want to lift weights. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was uh, I, important. I think that's a lot of mis misconceptions. A lot of guys are strong, so they don't think you got to be strong. They, they Like, you know, I've seen a lot of guys, coach, not you, but uh, like Carl Gauch is a big example. You know, you know who he was, a fighter, who? MMA. What's his name? Catch was Carl Gotch. Gotch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Carl was real strong, but he didn't lift weights. He did uh, push-ups, basic things. He didn't believe in weight training. Well, everybody's not Carl Gotch. That guy walked on, like you said. He wasn't like a bodybuilder, but <laughs> guy was jacked, you know, big. And uh, I think, and uh, also another thing, I'll say this, I mean, it's what I believe. Tommy Kono was extremely strong. Man, he broke a lot of world records, and he became the head of American weightlifting, I think, 1972. And I'd go up to High State, and there'd be snatching broomsticks. I go, "What are you guys doing? Oh, you got to do this. You got to work on technique, because Tom, Tommy had immense strength, terrible technique. So he thought you should train on technique all the time. But that was just Tommy. I guess he could break him down. That's why he got different positions. Yeah. You know, that's why you play a, a position and not." You know, somewhere else, I, you know. So with the, uh, um, I mean, it, it's, to, to me, it, it, it's pretty fascinating that, like, you know, because of the power lifting, it's kind of gotten this idea. But, like, I mean, the fact that, like, 
uh, you know, you're looking at all these different athletes, world-class athletes that are using something within your system. It seems like, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Especially in running. Yeah, let's get into that a little bit. I remember that day we showed up, uh, there was a girl who was, a, uh, I think she was a 400 or 800 meter runner who was uh, over there doing just a bunch of med ball work and she was doing a ton of stuff on the um, belt on, on the belt squad. I mean, it was uh, unbelievable. I mean, not only, I mean, that girl was physically impressive, mm-hmm. you know, looking the part. So, I mean, in terms of the sprinting, like how does the volume work? How does like the, I mean, is the training in, in, at all specialized for them? Yeah, well, I get a lot of feedback for people, but there's guys put girl on the Olympic medals by using my stuff. And they, they told me, you know, that they did it, the weight training, not the, and, uh, but one big, one thing we found out, it took us a while, you can't do max effort weights and max effort sprinting in the same week. It will destroy you. You have to cut the, the weight, weights out. That girl, I got a girl, she trains twice a week, real hard, real heavy, but twice a week, and then she used the other day for sprinting. When we try to max out twice, you know, a hard sprint and max out and with the weights, it all fell apart. Just could not handle the central nervous system, could not do it. So I, that's how we know close. We just do speed work and explosive stuff. 30, 40% weights and basically 40 to 50% weights. That's what we concentrate on. But blow up the heavy reverse hypers and the inverse curl and all of those things. I'll blow it up. So you can handle uh, like a ton of volume and intensity with the accessory movements and have them still sprint at a high level, right. but it's actually the barbell stuff that becomes kind of diminishing returns. Remember I told you about the jumps and we didn't jump for nine weeks and go broke over for three inches. Reach up and not touch nine, seven. It's not bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm with, not bad yeah. at all. Yeah. So with the, um, uh, it, I mean, like, are are they monitoring the sprinting kind of similar like you would on Prilip and Stable? You know, because I remember when we came in, we were talking about lifts over 90%, 4 to 10 reps. And my first question is, how do you know if you need 4 or 10? And I remember that was a funny conversation. And you were like, you know what, uh, the more advanced the lifter, the, the you know, the or the, the greater central nervous system efficiency he has, the less volume he needs. The, you know, not, I guess the intermediate lifter who needs more volume kind of drives up towards that, you know, higher level of, uh, of rep range. Mm-hmm. Well, you ever uh, read the book um, "Under Faster Secrets to Underground Running Faster" by Barry Ross? No, no. Forget that book. It's okay. just a little book. Um, they did experiments in there. They took uh, thirty about thirty three percent of the running away. See, that's what I have to do. You got to tell me what you're doing, then I could go from there. But well, they, they dropped thirty three percent of the running, and everybody ran faster. Their VO two max didn't change, and uh, and. Uh, Everyone else kept doing the same thing, and oh, I'll tell you about VO2, but, but anyhow, they, when they cut that running down, they, all their times increased. The group was kept, was kept the same, stayed the same. You know, your VO2 max in 1940 is the same as it is today. So everybody wants to concentrate on too much oxygen, you know, when it's the muscle endurance you have to have. I've seen, I've seen I have know a lot of fires, and they, they said to go out there, and I started going out to, uh, Colorado, whatever, and high altitude and all this. And they had tons of lungs, but their muscles just did not work very well. Well, I mean, isn't, um, I mean, really, like, how much can you really train on your VO2 max? I was kind of always, I I always thought you're kind of born with a VO2 max, and maybe there's a 5 to 7% that you can kind of go up, but it's not like, you know, a guy like Lance Armstrong had a VO2 max over, what, like 200 or something crazy. Yeah, you, I'm guessing because this is most, uh, they said in 12 to 18 months of intense training, you got it. It's, it's it. Yeah, and it's not but necessary. But you can get strong for years. Hell, you, you you can still get stronger than you've ever been if you want to. Uh, I'd like to believe that uh, oh, uh, no doubt. the best of my life is still ahead of me. I still believe that my uh, my best lifts are in front of me. How old are you? Uh, 45. See, I was I was uh, over 50, and and I uh, two inches inside the ring, I, cl- I benched 500. Yeah. If I did it, you damn well could yeah. do it. Yeah. Well, I, I remember uh, we were out here, what, 10 years ago when you were in your 60s. And uh, I saw you rack pull damn near 700 pounds. And then those old, then all those kids were talking shit to you. And you fucking went over there and strapped it up. I mean, it was impressive. I rack pulled seven, 765 on pin three when I was 63. Yeah. And then when I was uh, also, I pulled 675 in a meet easy in a meet from weighing 217. And then my neck took off. Yeah, I remember when we were out here, you were having that deal where when you went to unrack the bar, all of a sudden it was kind of putting uh, stress on the yeah, spine. Doing something weird. Doing something weird. I don't know why. They got worse and worse and just, just, just messed up. 
I'm a mess right now. I tell you what, I can say, I my body, every ounce of my body I put in this store, it it's killed me. I mean, it, it's destroyed me. But I wouldn't have learned anything if I had to. All I do is go home and read or I write. I read or I write. That's all I do. So you do that. I mean, I read. I mean, you know where people, uh, like, you know, if you, I'll ask you a question. Here, let me get my phone out and I'll tell you. For me, if I want to know something about anything, I'll start looking it up. Meanwhile, I go through five, six t- chapters, but then I'll stop along the way and I'll learn a lot of things in chapters I wasn't even going to look at. And I think that's a big help. I think that's a difference today about real intelligence. And I, I'm only smart in one thing, really. Well, if it wasn't for Tom and my wife and a girl, I'd be in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm a complete moron. I, you know, I almost died twice. That didn't help. And then, uh, but they do everything for me. I mean, all I, my mind, I'm like a shark. They always said a dinosaur had the mind, uh, you know, a brain of about the size of a walnut. Well, hell, they lasted a while. I go out last other. I'll bring your brain out of me. Yeah. You know, if you really want to be Albert Einstein, I mean, he probably couldn't start a car. So I'm not Albert Einstein. But I mean, the thing is, I put all my attention into one thing, and then boom, you know. And I got guys I'm constantly experimenting with. And I think that's what you got to have. You got you got to put them in groups. That's what we did. Chains and band. I had chain group. Well, there wasn't no bands. And we made progress. We went to bands and made tons of progress. But we would do this with a certain amount of loads. Just change things around and find out which one worked. I mean, I had, you know, back in, uh, I mean, Kenny Patterson, I mean, 640 raw bench at 260 and six and a quarter Georgia 220, uh, uh, 225. And I mean, I was a strong ass guy. They were all like that. So it, there was a, it was a good group to experiment. So these, like you said, they were like NFL, but we power lifted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I walked in, I mean, I hadn't seen an environment like that since training camp. It was, uh, it, it was fucking good. I mean, it was, it, it was comforting, but I could also see where uh, people walk in and think, "Oh fuck, what am I getting myself into?" Well, or people wouldn't come for a long time. <laughs> well, were afraid to come. Uh, the best was when we walked in. Uh, I think there was a bunch of like CrossFit people showed up, uh-huh. and they were like standing by the door and didn't know if they were going to like get mugged, get beat <laughs> up, get killed. Like they didn't want to come in there, you know. And they, I mean, it, it, it was, uh, it was funny. It, it was cool to see. I miss that. That's what I miss. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like athletic development, like, um, do you have like a template for uh, like athletic performance from like a young age? If you were going to like, if you could, you know, like my son is five and I hand him over to Louis Simmons at Westside Barbell, like how does that progression look? And more importantly, like, like when would you first kind of, uh, you know, like how would you uh, train him early on? When would you start introducing the barbell, like that life cycle of an athlete? Okay. Well, I wrote a book called The Rule Three. You know, it's what the Russians had to train young children from actually about, you know, from um, four to ten or whatever, but the rule three. And three years before you even pick a sport. Like, you know, if your dad, I don't know what your dad did, but he might have played football, so you're playing football. No, my Maybe. dad was a lawyer, and he oh, was from well, yeah. yeah, but he was from Culver City. So, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I grew up in Torrance, Palos Verdes area, which is right, like right on the other side of the freeway from that. So, when yeah. you said Culver City, I, yeah, I know that area. Well, I don't like to work with kids, but but they bring a, a few come in. First thing I I tell the parents when they go back, get them into wrestling school, get them into basic gymnastics. Yeah, that to teach them athleticism, and we also touch people and not being afraid to you know wrestle and someone putting your you know, elbow across your nose and all that. And then just start uh, practicing ball sports, hand and eye coordination, walking down planks where they could walk down a, 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 I just used to put a, a two by eight on the ground, then a two by six, two by four, take it on down, where they can walk, build balance and all that. Balance coordination, uh, and then decide what their aptitudes are towards what ball sport, if you're going to play ball. Mm-hmm. So, you know, can they, can they shoot a basketball or, can they box? You know, some boxes, you know, great boxes are born. Yeah. They're trained after they're born, but they are born. I, I, I mean, I had six pro fighters in the ring years ago. I was all right, 40. They want me to get an A with Pete to cramp. I'm going like, I've never had no little ass guy. But, you know, I mean, I'm trying to hit them over here, hit me in the side of the head. I go, how do you do this? Yeah. I've always been a great boxer because I admire what they could do, but I couldn't do it because I started too old. Yeah. So what you could learn at uh, before 10, you may never learn at 13 on. Mm-hmm. In, in Russia, I don't know if you know, 
Yeah, it starts at th it starts at uh, basically thirteen. It, uh, you start you you uh, you have a progression thirteen to fifteen, kind of like if you play bowl, and then from fifteen to seventeen, and you you got to get better seventeen to nineteen, and from nineteen to twenty one, you are made or you're going. It's good if you make it at nineteen on. It, it's called poly. You're polished. If not, you're out the door. You're not going to be a weightlifter. You're not going to be a boxer. You're not going to be. I remember this coacher. I watched the dead of 793 and a 165. And so I, and he couldn't speak English. He's, he was in Ukraine. And I, I said, well, what did he do? I said, did he weightlift? Because this guy had those back muscles like you never seen. And he goes, no, no, he wrestled. And I said, was he any good? He goes, no, just nice to cover. That's all he thinks. Probably like you, you know, if you didn't play D1 football, don't even talk to me. You're not a football player. You know, at least D1 football. And then into the pros. Yeah. yeah no. I, I, you know, you're a good example because I remember you were showing Kerr down there, Josh Kerr. You were beating a crap out of him. He said, I've never seen this stuff before. He said, Ohio State. Well, I had to say there's only four or five top schools in the country for football. He'd never seen that stuff. No, he didn't know how to use his hands. He didn't understand about position, angles, any of this stuff. Right. And so this kid was hoping to go play in the NFL. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to give you a fucking crash course on how to do this. And uh, he didn't understand about, like, uh, I mean, he kept on coiling his hips, didn't understand how to rebend. He was he was a waist bender, not a knee bender. Didn't understand hand position, like, uh, you know, two thirds inside out. I mean, all the shit I learned boxing as a kid and fighting, how to cut a guy off in the ring was pretty uh, applicable to being a play offensive line. Like the quarterback's here, I'm here, you're here. This is all a game of angles, understanding how to position to, you know, and then also the first meaningful touch, how to redirect somebody's momentum. Once they're there, how to basically, you know, challenge posture and position through full range of motion movements. I mean, this kid had never heard any of this. And he's looking at me like, and Louis looking at me and he's like, well, there's a difference between a guy that plays in the NFL for 10 years and this fucking kid who's probably sweeping the streets, which he didn't like when you told him that. Yeah, but it's exactly what, uh, it's what I'm talking about right now. You know, he didn't have anyone to teach him. Obviously, you did. Thank God. I, I mean, I think like boxing and all that, like you said, you fought. I think that's one of the best things. Yeah. Builds some courage, man. Get, you, get used to hitting, hitting in the face. Well, you also realize the the power of the first meaningful touch. Like when you come out there and like, you know, you understand like striking distance. And like it was always interesting for me where I'd see guys like wait and I'm like, I can throw your hands out there. But then a lot of guys are fearful because they don't have the athleticism to be able to move in space that if their hands miss, do, can their feet make up for it? And my whole deal was uh, within the confines of the box, you know, my three by three area, nobody was going to out-athlete me. You know, like, I mean, you might be able to shoot hoops or this other stuff, but like I was a master of my domain. And uh, to the point where like I constantly wanted to fool people into thinking, fuck, that guy's athletic. I might not be athletic in the way, but within the confines of this box, I'm a better athlete than you. That's all it counts. Um, it's funny because way back in the, oh, it'd be mid to early, it'd be 92, 95, I had a lineman come in and play for the Giants and train here for a while. And he was telling me it's all feet. He said, if you don't have the feet, you ain't playing. Jump and roll. Yeah. You know, being able to move through space. There's another, it's in my book. Man, I get time to give you all my stuff when you leave here. Whatever you guys want, just ask them what you want. Uh, it's, uh, I said jump rope because it also builds up more strength for the connected tissue. No, I mean, I always felt that jumping rope is one of the best speed exercises I ever had. Oh. You know, and then also conditioning with like high, uh, high knees jumping and being able to get your knees up. Do you see many people do it? Uh, I program the shit out of it for oh, okay. all of our programs. I mean, so there's a... Um, uh, Man, I've said this for years on this podcast. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I didn't invent any of this shit. Um, I've just been fortunate enough to have the coolest friends and been able to have the best mentors. Like, um, you know, Old Man Zang is talking about, uh, you know, Hatfield's compensatory acceleration. When we interviewed Fred, telling, you know, talking to him about it and how he, you know, figured this thing out and how he, I mean, these are all how you learn within the mentor process or coming out and hanging out with you for a couple of weeks and seeing like the West Side system, not from reading the books, but actually seeing it from the inside and understanding. And I tell people all the time, you can read all the books you want on West Side, but until you go to West Side and, and talk to Louie, you don't really understand the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fred was a big influence on me. You know, I'd see my mates and we'd talk a minute and he'd say, you know, well, you got to have an electric stem. Well, I'd go buy one. You need an ice connect machine. I'd go buy one, you know. Whatever it was, whatever he said, I said, hell, I'm getting this thing. Well, he was a, he was a gymnast. 
And uh, oh. he told us the story on an airplane where he kicked up into a handstand and was doing freestanding handstand push-ups on an airplane because some guy told him he couldn't do it. <laughs> and I remember we asked him, like, how many did you do? He's like, I think I did 50. And I, I don't know if it was uh, if, if that was a catfish story or what, but fuck, can you imagine uh, Fred Fred Hatfield kicking up in the aisle and doing 50 freestanding handstand push-ups? Yeah, crushing record squats and then back flips right behind the barbell Yeah, because he's so excited. You see, see, that's why I watched that with uh, Olympic weightlifters overseas. You know, I, I, I mean, the ones that would do it, lift and do a backflip. I'm going like, man, I couldn't do a backflip. My life depended on it. Yeah. It is funny how you learn. You got, but you got to, I've told people many times, I'm a much better student than I am a teacher. I learn. I listen. I listen what, you know, I come out here by what you say. I'll pass it on somebody. I got a million football players always wanting to stop in here and, I just don't have time anymore. I mean, I can't do it no more. Well, you also told me that uh, it wasn't fun to train them anymore because you'd already figured it out. Yeah. I remember we were talking about it, and I was like, man, how come more football players don't show up? And you're like, I'm not interested in it. I already cracked that code. I want to work. And I remember at the time you were telling me, you're like, I want to work with the fighters. I think that's the, you know, that's where I can see a lot of what we're doing really have great carryovers in the fight community. Yeah. And then the problem, well, yeah, they pay, they pay me a lot of money to talk to MMA. I'm huge in MMA. Yeah. People, people have no idea, you know. But um, yeah, it's like I—I I mean, I'll bring guys at, jo- at, Kurt, at Josh is one of my football player. But I had—I uh, I would average twelve guys. I average three tens in two months. Yeah. And all you know, big guys aren't. You know, I mean, I can't compare. You know, <laughs> but you know, you take a guy who weighs what you do, and you take, uh, and then you take a, a guy who weighs one hundred sixty. There's no way that big guy can do the chin-ups or pull-ups that guy could do. Relative strength, they need relative strength. And the little guys need brute-ass strength. Try to, you know, keep them all, keep them being mauled. That's what I found. And it was, it was, it was um, you know, was, what we did, they maxed out with us. And uh, they, um, well, normally put them by themselves. Max out, speed day, lots of, uh, 80 jumps a week, and a lot of sled working, pushing and pulling sleds. That's what that is all it was. I never ran them. And, but the higher you jump, the faster you'll sprint. Sure. So it's basically for football, you ain't going. You know. can, can you talk about uh, um, like the influence and more importantly the importance of training groups? That was the one thing that was uh, uh, like different compared to any place else I've been. And I mean, we saw it in the NFL. You find like, for me, I would uh, find the guy who was either the strongest and if I was the strongest, but the next strongest guy. And like that was within my training group because you need somebody to compete with. I mean, that's something that nobody talks about. And really the thing when people ask me about Westside, I'm like, it was the intensity and the competition in the daily training groups where almost Louis over there, like the fucking mad scientist pitting people against each other, trying to talking shit. This guy says he's stronger than you. That guy's not stronger than me. I mean, that's psychological warfare and the, and the, and the uh, effectiveness of the groups. My friend said I could make Gandhi kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I watched him fucking get in somebody's head and then fucking people storming out, fucking trying to break things. It was great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's everything. I mean, you, like I said, environment's everything. My gym lacks environment right now. We used to bet so much money. I mean, not, you know, it'd be two, three hundred dollars on a box for the box. We could box lot the most. Two, three hundred dollars on a deadlift platform. It was, it was every week almost. And it wasn't about the money, you know. It, I don't know, but. I mean, money never motivated me, but I'm going like I want that money, even though I never won it from you know. Good. And then uh, it's uh, also team things. We'd have two and three man uh, team in like deadlift, squat, or or uh, you know rack pull or something. And like what we'd add, like us three would add up our number to beat them. And if you needed 20 pounds above your all time record to win, nine times out of ten you pulled it, I, because you just had that little team thing going on there. And I think that helped. And actually, you know, I blew my knee off in 91. I was done. I mean, I, I, I accomplished everything I thought I could do. And then uh, Kenny Patrick pulled me out of retirement. He, I, I said, Kenny, are you ever going to bench seven again? He's world record for it. And he just, you know, falling off. And he, and he looked at me and says, old man, you'll never have seven pounds on your back again. Well, I come out of retirement right now. Yeah. <laughs> and this is 1997. And by, by 2002, I was squatting 100 more at 920. Sec, only Eddie O'Cone, I was squatting me. I had the fourth biggest total that year. And the reason is, and I'll tell you the reason is, did, train, did, did the training change much? No. 
to Dave Tate, and Chuck is like a ditch digger. You know, you go to work, you gotta dig 300 feet of dirt if you wanna get paid. So you work like a fool. And Dave Tate, I've, you know, I've always said it, biggest liar, cheat I've ever seen. <laughs> Your box is high. No, my <laughs> box is high. You know what I mean? Always trying to take a mat out. We say, oh, you know, take it out there. You know, those guys, uh, that that motivate those guys push me. Like Dave said, he tried to kill me a hundred times. I tried to kill him too, and and, and it paid because I was twenty years. You know, they're fifty. I'm seventy four, but I said, "F them," and and it, and it, and they knew, they knew I would never back down. I mean, they hauled me out of here a couple of times. I never backed down. Well, I mean, uh, the fact that you've fucking obviously, uh, you know. Like I always, the analogy I think is like a, a, a wet rag. You basically have wrung this thing out for every drop in it yeah. and you're at 74. I mean, it goes to show that at the end of the day, the person that can remain strongest is usually the person that's going to last the longest. Yeah. You know, when they look at actuary tables, it's actually the person that maintains uh, lean body mass and muscle mass the longest pushes themselves out. It's when people get weak or their you know nervous system gets weak and they fall, break a hip and they become weak that ended up. That's, that's the end of you. Yeah. What happened to me, I got my neck hurt and then, uh, Kid wanted me to spar. I said, okay. I said, you can, you can, you can kick me in the head, but don't kick me in the knees. Well, kick me in the knee. Last tendon I had, it was a torn tore. All four of my tendons. I thought I could get a, a you know, repaired. But I go to Cleveland up at Strong Shell, Mark Marinelli was, you know, Steve Pay and all them guys. And the doctor goes, you really? He said, there's no help. You, you need a new knee. And that really, so that was pretty much it. I, did, yeah, uh, I did you get a knee replacement? It. Yeah, on this one here. This is screwed up, but I guess as long as I train on it, I'm fine. So you got a, a knee, I know you got a hip and a shoulder? shoulder. No, a knee and a shoulder. Okay, knee and a shoulder. Yeah, I got a, a shoulder replacement benched up, 100 pound dumbbells, 34 reps. Yeah. And I tell people, I just really think about therapy. Get on therapy fast, don't wait. You know, when they operate on you, you're going to move your arm all, or your knee every which way it can go. Then they put it in the cast and don't want you to move for eight weeks. And that's never made any sense to me. So I don't do it. I go, I go right back, buddy. I benched a, a broomstick. I benched a broomstick in seven days after surgery with my shoulder, and in three months, raw, I benched three hundred. Now they still got people in, in arm casts, mm -hmm. but I didn't do it that way. I used the band bar, ultra, ultra high reps. I didn't. We had to have had the band bar at the time, but a straight bar with the vibrating kettlebells, and light dumbbells up to two hundred reps of twenty-five pound dumbbells and stuff like that. You know, soft tissue work. That's all I did. Yeah. Every day. So. One of my uh, favorite moments of Westside was um, we had, uh, well, the bamboo bar was still pretty new. And so, like, a lot of people hadn't seen it. We came in. I remember we worked on it. And then I left and I came back. And that day, one of the guys were doing it. We went over there. And the guy's like, hey, you want to jump in and give this a try? I was like, sure. How does it work? <laughs> and so the typical thing is you try to invite the new guy, not realizing he's going to fucking kill himself. And I laid down and, like, just like nice and easy motion. And like it was confused. I'm like, oh, let's throw a little on. This was kind of easy. And then all of a sudden hit it again. And the guy's like, have you done this before? I'm like, of course. But yeah, I mean, we, we got to the point where we were trying to break that thing. I think we loaded it up with 315 pounds and we were able to get five to 10 reps. Yeah, I did 270 for nine. And, but what I found too is the therapy bar, but the stronger I was on, like you're saying, the stronger my bench was. I did 270 for nine. I watched Hoff do uh, 335 for 10. I mean, he's not even beginning to be in that level. But. Yeah, he, uh, the, the one thing that was interesting, and I was going to ask you a little bit on it, um, when you, with the bamboo bar, when you bring it down, it's kind of a straight line, like a little bit of an arc. But then you talk about like with the shirt, I mean, those guys bring touch and they almost drive this way. No, but rotation. then when you watch raw benching, there's almost like a J curve or like a, a, a yeah, little bit of a... Take, but whenever you do this, you're rotating a tear rotator. It's just a matter of time. Peck, a rotator. So that idea of keeping it tucked and going in a straight line opposed from that kind of little bit of a... Yeah, I've always, you know, always kept it straight line and never got hurt. Takes a strong upper back, side and rear delt. And it's strong tricep. And strong, well, strong lats to be able to hold it in a position too. that, yeah. I remember but you could, telling me that. But you kind of like take the peck out, a bit out of it. Howard kept tearing pecs. He went had like concrete block for chest. And I said, George... You have got, and he had a 475 overall bench. Now, it, you know, it went well. I said, George, until you make your arm stronger than your chest, you're going to keep tearing your chest because the right muscle has to fire correctly. Or that's what coordination is. And it, it took like a year and a half, and he finally got through his head, and he never tore back again. Yeah. 
more uh, more tricep within I, his bench? I watched him bench. I, uh, he benched three fifteen for forty, and Mike Wolf did it for fifty. Three fifteen. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's yeah, mentioned. that's yeah, that's a lot of fucking reps. Yeah, well, I got a question on potential. So you've had thousands of athletes come through the doors, all different sports. Is there a moment when you decide to invest in someone? Is it when you see them fail on a rep, see them succeed on something, that you start to pour in? I like it. I just generalize the whole thing. Not like a miss that or miss that. I mean. You know, all I do, I, my coaching theory, I just tell them to do one thing, and I leave them alone. I don't, I don't coach. And I, people said, how you said all the programs? So I don't. The percent thing's easy. Like I said, it don't matter if you squat 200, 600, 800. It's all based. It's all math based. You know, if you, take, you, if you had to just add up, you, you squat six, so you use the weights the equivalent to that for 25 reps. And, okay, so add that volume up. And then, you know, then next week, if you did seven, add that up, your volume goes way up. See? And so it's all based. That way you never, see, people don't get it. You never overtrain with the system. Because there's guys uh, who come in and try to get you to do, uh, well, you know, you go into a gym, you get this real strong guy. Everybody tries to emulate him. They all get hurt, and he keeps getting stronger. So, see, this way it's based on your potential, not anyone else's. And I just keep him in line with that and say, dude, you got no hamstring or low backer. I got a kid down there. He uh, he'd been here right at a year, and he had a, a five twenty five deadlift in the one he wants to pull seven hundred. That's some serious progress, you know. So it's uh, it's just working on what you got to work on. You know, don't work on things that don't work. My friend Sicario over he said it does no stone to be strong in the wrong with the wrong exercise, and he's right. You know, you be the greatest whatever, but if you ain't paying that position, what good is it do you? So how do I mean? How do you? I mean, I, I, I guess it's all trial and error based upon the individual. Um, you know, the idea of like, uh, you know, finding the right exercises as your drivers. Well, I can. T- I mean, if your knees come in, you got weak hips. You know, if you round over, you probably got a weak sto- lower back or stomach. Uh, if you press bars over your face, you got weak uh, arms, and you put too much on the shoulder, you're gonna no doubt you're gonna get hurt. And I tell guys down there, and they do it, and they go, man, I wish I'd have listened. I said, I wish you had it, too. <laughs> I mean, I got a kid that squatted 10, 1040 or 45 at one, 220. And I kept saying, when you start getting some weights on, nowadays you're tight, put some briefs on. I don't care if it's car hard short. Now he tore his groin. So. And then he would bench it too heavy, super heavies, and he's my height. He'd have to catch, stretch the weight out. And I said, you're going to tear a peck, getting out of that way out. And he did. A completely ruined his bench. Now, you know, what do you do? I just hope he tells people don't do what he did. You know, that's all I can ask. Why? I mean, um, why? I mean, the, it seems crazy to me that if uh, you got to make every mistake yourself. I remember my dad told me he's like, if you got to make every mistake yourself, you're gonna have a hard fucking life. <laughs> so, like, if you can't learn from the mistakes of others, <laughs> yeah. then uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna struggle. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, here's a situation where you're you know haven't done this for you know, shit, 40, 50 years, and you're bringing people in and giving them information and they're still not grasping it or more importantly, making the changes. Yeah, and I think, like you talked about gear, I think gear, in a way, has kind of ruined our sport. Although, I'm I'm, a, I'm all with, if you wear gear, that's what, you make the rules, I follow the rules. But I, I, these guys, instead of getting a stronger bench, you want a stronger shirt. Yeah. You know, if they want a stronger daily or squat, they get a stronger squat suit can't do that man you've got to do the work sled dragging is one of my primary things man you've got to drag sleds sleds sled, that that well you didn't see her but kylie i mean she's like five nine and a half weighs 136 she pulls up um five plates on a sled all the time 225 pounds on blacktop just and she carries the med ball to stay straight up and down you don't want to go lean forward when you pull sleds or you put all the way on your toes and you keep it off the glute you want to keep it on the glutes, so. Damn. But like I said, it's, it's, just, pie- it's just piecing things together. Like it's like a puzzle. What part of the puzzle is missing? Fill that part in, and now you got a picture, you know. Yeah. And potential is, I could tell guys are they're going to be good, you know, after a while. It's hard to get guys even as the right body. I mean, it, it's very, very, very hard. You mean for powerlifting? Yeah. yeah. What do, way too tall skin. What, what would be the ideal? 
Like what? Dave Hoff? What's he, like five? five? Oh, yeah, he probably days about an inch or two taller than me at the most. Um, like at 165, should be five five foot. He's way to come here. And I said, I'll tell you why you guys, you know, they lack two things. I mean, I'll tell them, you know. I wrote a book on and it's just like the Chinese. They, they said, I'm crazy. Go read what the Chinese do. Chinese got my equipment. Well, and, and the other thing is, is they have a system and they look for people with that fit the anthropometrical ratios of their yeah, system. That's right. And then uh, the other thing, too, is uh, those guys Olympic weightlift, but shit, the amount of bodybuilding work they do is insane. Well, I know. That's what I mean. They're, they say, I don't like the word, but they say after every workout, they do two bodybuilding exercises. I don't like, I'd rather just, you know, build muscle. Mm -hmm. But, and look at them guys. Yeah, they're impressive. Oh, my God. But I mean, you got what billions of people in your country, That's and uh, you know it's a communist deal. I mean, there's probably like, and you're going to be a weightlifter, you know. Yeah. Whereas uh, we're in a little bit of a different deal. Yeah, and if you don't meet, you're right back on the farm. <laughs> yeah. You're sweeping streets or whatever the hell, or you get a bad social credit number. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, um, I mean, obviously the the legacy of West Side, but like with uh, like the mindset, and more importantly, like you know, not just the sets and reps. Like, what do you think West Side has contributed to this whole thing? And powerlifting in general. Yeah, powerlifting, Success. athleticism. Constantly reaching new heights. You know, as I said, we break records all the time. I have one twenty three with no gear. You squat a six thirty five world record. With gear, you squat a seven hundred. Um, he mentioned 505 and 23s and a 32. So uh, then the girl, you know, I mean, she got tons of records. You go down there right now, I can, I, we got a lot of world records on that wall, and I, I'm disappointed because I, I need new blood. Like, you know, every year, why you got football combines? You can't just keep playing the same player. A few years down the line, it wouldn't be nobody play football. Yeah. What, uh, I mean, are, are you struggling to bring in new blood? I'm trying. I mean, we put ads out and everything, but. I don't know, man. The world. My, Marcus up there with, in the strong style says it's hard to find a guy that really don't like where he wants to hurt you. They don't, you know, it's like a, more like a sport to them, which MMA is a sport. I, but I've been around these guys. I mean, some of these guys, like Mark Coleman, these guys, they don't break a rib your arm. You know, they could turn on you in a second, like a like a dog. You know, I, and he says it's so hard to find a guy like that. Attitude. You're not going to quit. And if you get beat, then you'll be back next week. And mm -hmm. it's yeah, you know, it's the same. I just think it's society. I really do. I you know I think it's it's got a lot of like you said. It's there's a lot of things to it, but it's society. It has to be. I I hope. You know we're over here like my buddy in there. He said, and he you know, over there in Ukraine, all oh, they're raising these kids, 13, 14 years old, to be soldiers. We can't even decide if you're boys or girls over here anymore. That's a big fucking difference when you're going to be going running into combat with them. Well, I mean, it's uh, what, what's interesting is when you start removing hardship, and uh, um, if even if you listen to the way people are kind of talking today, um, life has never been this good. It's never been this simple. It's never been this easy. I mean, the most access. I mean, the fact that you can get on your phone and have any type of food you want delivered to your house within minutes, which still blows my fucking mind. I mean, we've talked about it on the podcast. Like, I'm, I'm probably like Louis. I'm, I'm, I've never ordered food online. Like, I'm like, like but like, you can order anything. Nine numbers. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, so it's uh, like things have never been this easy. And I think what happens when things are this easy, people start searching for hardship or they start searching for ways. And unfortunately, they're not looking for the good hardship. But when you put people in these situations, like you're in the Ukraine, like you said, they're armoring kids. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're forcing them into a certain life. Whereas that's all they know. My buddy, you know, he's a John Sayer Jiu Jitsu and says he'd go to Brazil and, uh, or even Carlos Carvella was here at, uh, he told me when they was, he says, he, down here, poor is, you know, beat up housing project down there. It's living in a cardboard box. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you want to true, see true poverty, I mean, we went to Brazil, we went to Rio and seen the favelas and the shanties and like metal roofs. I mean, with how people are living. Uh, I, I still tell the story. We were walking down the street and there was a, a, an alleyway and there had to be about 50 kids were playing futsal uh, with that little ball. They were playing this game. They were playing soccer in this alleyway. And uh, there was probably a 25 on 25 with this little ball. And these kids were playing this game. And it was amazing to see. And it was the only place that they could play that wasn't out in the streets. And they didn't have access to this. And they were playing this game. And uh, whenever you ask people about why the Brazilians are so good at soccer, it's because they play this futsal game, which is this little ball, real high, you know, real high speed. 
And uh, I mean, that's all they do. That's all they got. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you put people into these situations, greatness, uh, you know, becomes the inevitable kind of return. Yeah. yeah, you imagine if you even get a uniform. I mean, that's a prize thing if you got a uniform. Or shoes. Wear. Or shoes. Or yeah, cleats. Probably, yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, the. Uh, I mean, I'd probably treat these guys too good. Well, uh, I mean, think about it. Like uh, in the 80s, uh, I mean, I remember seeing those videos. I mean, the amount of lifters and people fighting to come here. And is it because, like, I mean, people aren't looking to suffer, they don't want the hardship, or is it just so easy because you have access? I mean, you remember, I mean, like you said, you had to call you on the phone. Now it's like, you know, there's internet forums and books, and there's so much access to information. I know, I hate it. Because <laughs> they handle it all, and I don't get to. I, anyone who wants my number, I give it to them because I'm, I'm supposed to talk to them. I don't need someone talking for me. They don't know what the hell they're doing anyhow. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know what I'm doing down here and what they're doing up there. So I, I need to talk to them. And like I said, I, I found too, if you had it done this, you'd probably talk to a, a person or two and just, oh my God, I'm so inspired to you know, go play football or whatever. I, some probably drove you into football. I, you know. Well, for me, um, uh, so my older brothers played football. And uh, I remember um, you know, going out there and playing like I – What's funny is uh, my brothers used to make fun of me because I was real skinny, had a real skinny neck. My brother used to take an orange and put it on a pencil and then be like, snap it and be like, this is your neck. And so, like I said, I wanted to lift weights and I wanted to be bigger and stronger. And I knew that all the guys that uh, played football were all big and strong dudes. So I figured like they all go to that weight room thing. I'm going to go to that weight room thing, like playing football. I want to be big and strong. And uh, I got out there and I realized that playing football, especially at that age, was like fighting against people that didn't know how to fight or box. And because we had done a ton of fight stuff early on and I got out there and was like, oh, shit. And then all of a sudden I grew taller. You know, I had 100 scholarship offers. And I remember my dad telling me, he's like, are they going to pay you to go to school? And I was like, I think so. I think this is what these letters mean. <laughs> and I remember just wanting to go to school to get a degree because, I mean, I never thought I'd play in the NFL. But uh, the fact that I got to go play to school and I could like, you know, didn't have to ask my parents to pay for anything. And, um, and then I got out there and I was just stoked to go to college. And then I remember I was on the scout team as a freshman, uh, redshirt and, uh, the guys I used to go against every day, they got drafted. Both guys got drafted in the top 10 to go play in the NFL, uh, Dwayne Clemens and, and uh, Reagan Upshaw. And I remember thinking like, I fought those dudes every single day and they didn't beat my ass that bad. Mm. I can do this job. And then all of a sudden you're going out and you're playing against guys on, on Saturdays that all of a sudden are getting drafted in the NFL and they're playing pretty good. And you're like, you know, and I remember I played against a guy, he got drafted and he started as a rookie and I'm watching him thinking, fuck, I whooped up on this dude. And now he's starting in the NFL and playing pretty well. And then all of a sudden you get to the chance where you're thinking, shit, I can do this. Mm. And then you go out there and I remember showing up as a rookie realizing that the jump from high school to college was like orders of magnitude greater than the jump from the college to the NFL. It wasn't that big a jump. I mean, I remember showing up at 18 and there were 23 year old dudes with beards. Mm. Now all of a sudden I'm 23 playing against 30 year old men. And it's not that big a difference. And uh, then you get out there and you realize, like, man, I can do this job. And then it starts becoming fun. And then you get to basically impose your will and get paid a lot of money to go fucking beat people's asses every <laughs> Sunday in front of millions of people in cool uniforms. I mean, what a fucking great job. Who wouldn't want to do that? That's what I've always said. Going out in those, front of those crowds. Yeah, you run out there and, you know, 100,000 people cheering and screaming. And you basically get to, like, I mean, the shit that you'd probably go to jail for if you did out in the street. You get to get paid and it's fucking, uh, it's glorified. People cheer your name for it. And, uh, I mean, I would have done it even if it was, there wasn't anybody in the stands just for the fact that you get to know exactly how good and bad you are every single Sunday. And uh, I think, you know, with, with, uh, uh, you know, with powerlifting in your training, you have the ability to go in and actually measure how good or bad you are every time you step to the bar. And I think that's what I always loved about lifting weights and the fact that the, the weights have no fucking memory, which I think is the funniest thing. You know, you go in there, you lift weights, and you're like, man, I used to crush this weight, and it doesn't remember me? I know, I know. It, it, it's like this, like, I, and I, I tell people this constantly, like, the weights have no respect for you. They have no memory. Just because you did it a year ago doesn't mean you can do it today, and that motherfucker doesn't care about you. I've always said, if you think you're cocky, just put five more pounds on the bar. You know what I mean? It, it, it really taught me a lot. It kept me out of a lot of trouble when I was a kid. A lot. So when uh, what made you get into uh, powerlifting? I mean, you said you were in the army and you got out, but what was well, the? Because um, right out of high school, I Olympic lifted. You know, started at fourteen, and uh, I had to work all the time. I was out of town, but I worked, and I was—I mean, I was, you know, 260 at fourteen years old, 140 pounds. But then there's a Larry Pacific. I had a meet out in Dayton, Ohio, and I was getting drafted two weeks later. I went out there, 
And because I would live here and I get first, second, third, you know, almost in very wherever I went in Ohio. And I went out there and there was 11 guys. I'd be the 55 year old man. I was 10th. I go, oh, this is my sport. And I'm looking at these guys. I'm going like, what the, how do these guys get built like this? You know, compared to Wailer, they, you had to put a sign on them. I live weights. And I, I said, this is it. I'm done. I never lived, I'm never a powerlifter again. I, I like power clean. I did power clean. I power clean 320 at 180, but the bar didn't revolve. Remember those Hercules 555 sets? It didn't revolve. And uh, But then when I broke my back, I could never power clean again. Could not roll my hips forward. Kill my third lumbar vertebrae. I mean, like, yeah. devastated. And you, you did that doing good mornings? I did. I doing 435 good mornings for five. Yeah, up at Ohio State, of all places. Let me go up there and I. I was not used to a lot of computing. I trained in my basement all the time by myself. You know how college campuses are. And I lost my concentration and me and it hauled me home. Laid on my floor for three days peeing in a coffee can in my living room. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. That's when I realized because after 10 months, uh, no one was going to, there, I was not going to get fixed. I was not going to, I'm going to, if someone's going to fix me, it's going to be me. And I dreamed up to doing a reverse hyper exercise. And that's what did it. So that's, that's, you know, one thing that's led to another, like, like you, one thing led to another, to another, to another. You know, how you do business, you start a little business, you make an investment, make money, take that money, invest in something else, make money, make that money, invest in something bigger. Yeah. And then what about like the, uh, I mean, uh, you know, if you walk into Westside, I mean, there's uh, a ton of interesting equipment. I mean, you know, like uh, like the fact that none of this stuff existed and you saw a need like that, like you were saying, that inverted uh, leg curl, kind of like something like a frog would do. Yeah. Like, I mean, how, MR19, yeah. like how, uh, like, you know, I mean, was it something where, you know, there was a need and or, you know, an idea like how uh, how did the inspiration for all that? It could have been I could have invented things for football had I been a football because, like I said, I got the track girl and another girl. And, and I was watching them, I said, you know what? If uh, they need to get these hips stronger and everything, if they want to they pull themselves, you know, backwards. And, man, it, it works. That thing. Whenever Rogue gets to making these things, you're going to sell a lot of those. They work. Uh, Is Rogue going to make them? Yeah, they're making they They got all contracts and everything down there. Oh, okay. Yeah. They just have steel production. They couldn't get to steel. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a fucking mess. I, it is a mess. Because I, I weld and fabricate and I work on trucks and it's part of like my, uh, my hobby is I, uh, so in, in my uh, power athlete, we have uh, about a f- 5,000, it's about 5,200 square foot building and then half is the gym and then the other half is my shop where I weld and fabricate and I work on trucks. Wow. So Easy. I, I uh, uh, put diesel motors in big trucks and um, I got a, a, you know, I've done bunch of crazy shit so <laughs> i'm uh when i heard about your health cat i got excited because i have um, a 62 uh uh 62 ls motor that i'm doing an lsa supercharger on in, in one of my trucks right now so i'm in the process of messing with that thing so but uh i mean the steel i mean dude what i used to be able to get a, a like a sheet of four by eight you know uh quarter inch steel for i mean it's gone up five fold in the last two years it's, it's mm-hmm. actually insane I mean, the point where I've, I've been hoarding metal and it's like, man, to have to go out and actually production this stuff. And then the problem is the consumer doesn't know that because they don't know what metal prices are. So a machine that, you know, hey, that thing should cost X. Fuck, to go buy that machine now is 3X. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of steel in that machine. We were playing with it. Yeah, things, everything's gone bonkers. Well, I mean, that would be definitely a fun machine to have. I, I wonder if they're going to, like, make one that's uh, um, a little more, I guess you could say, space-friendly, because that's a big fucking machine. It is a big machine, but somebody like you needs a machine that big. We <laughs> might be almost too long for that machine. Oh, yeah, no, I squeezed in there and got in oh, there. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah you, no. got, you got everything straight, your yeah. legs? Uh-huh. And all. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, uh, as we started doing it, I'm like, oh, this isn't that bad. And all I could think of was, like, if we keep putting more weights on, this shit's going to get real ugly. Yeah, it's a good one, though. I, I mean, how do I know this? Not by what we do, but, I, you know, a lot of baseball players and all kinds of different people, they, they all love it. Fighters love it. They love it. Everybody loves it. So what do you think in terms of uh, like, a you know, I mean, obviously you have a ton of templates and whatever, you know, for power lifting, you know, with the sprinters, it's all different. I mean, does everybody kind of, you know, follow a West Side influence program, but it's all kind of individually based? Well, when you come here, there's so many injuries in sprinting. And that's what my book is, uh, Prevention of Injuries, Strength Manual and Prevention of Injuries. 
Well, how do you get her running? And, and so I talked to the high state coach. He came here well. I said, why do you get these injuries? He said, well, they're overuse injuries. I said, why do you overuse them? Why don't you do something else? Hmm. And, it, you know, you were born running. An idiot, a chicken can run with his head top. And don't take a genius. I've said a million times, and that you, you were there. Now you, you might say, yeah, Lou, you're right or wrong. But I will guarantee you, if it wasn't for uh, NFL, uh, there would be players in the NFL that would be the world record for the 60 to 100 meters. Yeah. Uh, they would they'd have run both. There's no way they wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, we these just, guys are like. Yeah, we had a new 40 yard dash record at the combine this week. Yeah, so four point two one. Yeah, four two one, which is is interesting because uh, Deion Sanders allegedly ran faster than that. So like the story goes that like Deion like when they did like I mean uh, who knows it's all these fucking Who's, legends. Is Deion <laughs> telling the story? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, man. Like I. Uh, I so the problem I have with some of this stuff, like, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what the, like, like where they brought, like, fuck, how do I say this? And that sound like a complete fucking asshole. Um, I don't believe that the, that the kids are training as hard today as they used to. So like we're seeing more stuff. So then is it like, is it the timing? Is it the technique? Is it just the admin of technology, which more app, you know, track. like, I mean, is it track? Like, what is it? But I, I really don't believe that the kids are training. Cause I'll just tell you this, just looking at like the offense alignment, um, when I played, uh, everybody looked well put together. Like everybody's shirts filled sleeves out. Like everybody looked pretty stacked. Like we were talking about, uh, like Nebraska in 94, 95, 96, like those dudes look like football players. I see the guys today. Shit, they don't look like they do any curls. I'm like, give these guys some hammer curls. At least give them some fucking arms to fill out their jerseys. And I, I, I don't know why they've gotten away from this. I mean, everybody should do some classic bodybuilding just so you look good on Sunday. And, uh, you know, pack a little muscle on. That shit's the best investment you can for a vo- uh, injury, like we said. I mean, that's the, that's the fucking armor you need to be able to go out and survive this job. Uh, Louis, I got a question for you. Do you feel there's a difference between injury prevention training and then not hurting your athletes in training? Yeah, because they're going to get hurt in training because they ain't doing shit. Now, these coaches are afraid to hurt people. Just, you shouldn't even be a coach. You know, I know they make good money. I know some NFL coaches, you know, they make pretty good money. But I couldn't do that job. I'm not going to put you in my race car and have you drive 80 miles an hour instead of 180 miles an hour. I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, they all got these gimmicks. I can Everybody's got a gimmick, and gimmicks are gimmicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, what's, so what's the future of this thing? I mean, is it, uh, I mean, are, are we seeing a regression? I mean, or, do, or is it just cyclical? I mean, do, does everything, like you said, does it kind of run like this? I think that's what it is. And I think someone's got to start back, write it down, and teach the basics. You know, like I said, you, what you did with Josh down there that day, you've never seen those things. That was nothing for you because you learned the basics. He's never even learned the basics, so you, you think he would come out with high state, but obviously no. They bring him down here, and I'm going like, you got to be kidding me. This, the last time I quit doing this, they brought, I don't know, it was four or five guys to you know, drive out for the combine. Three of them could not, let's see, they, see three of them could not bench um, 300 pounds, and they couldn't box like 400 pounds. And these are these are all somebody online, and I go. This is I'm done with this. This, you know, I, I never seen anything like it. I'm going. How could this guy be that big in that week, and 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 live to play football? Or that, or your, your opponent's not very strong. Well, that's why you see guys like Aaron Donald who come out and running through these dudes because I mean that guy's pretty well put together. You can tell he trains him. Mean, he's got the you know the appearance of somebody. Like I could always tell. Like I can, without a shadow of a doubt, tell you whether or not a dude lifts weights. And I, you know, normally traps and shoulders and some of the other kind of uh, intangibles that you only get from under a barbell. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's when somebody's like, oh, I lift weights. I'm like, you know, whatever you're doing, you don't look like you lift weights. We, <laughs> we must be lifting different weights. Yeah. And then you see a guy like that and they're over there. I mean, they can't fucking kiss his ass enough on TV. And it's just because the offensive linemen aren't training like they need to. Like, like uh, I mean, I played with dudes that would have fucking killed that guy. And it was because there was just a different mentality. And I don't know, maybe it's social media. I don't know. I can't figure it out for the life of me. But I, I always thought that the uh, uh, the weak link in our society was access to information. You know, like I, I was telling them that um, 
I was real fast when I was growing up, and then I grew a whole bunch, and I was real slow, and I couldn't figure it out. So I went to the library, and I checked out a book on, uh, on speed running. And uh, the only thing I remember was downhill running, like if you can run, do over speed. So I drove around looking for like a hill to run downhill. And um, I mean, but now, I mean, shit, how many people are going to the library? How many people are calling people asking, you know, showing up, you know, hat in hand, make me great. They and, like you get on the field. You know, but like that's what uh, that's where that mentorship process comes from and coming to learn. And I, I just think it's uh, I just think too much access to information. It's almost overwhelming. I mean, think about how many systems there are and everybody's got, like you said, a gimmick and this and this. But at the end of the day, there is no fucking gimmick. Yeah, they got a gimmick. But as I always say, where's the result? Where's the results? When I was a kid, uh, Jerry Schottenstein, he multimillionaire and the guy I worked for, he gave me a job at 12 as a bartender. And, but for some reason they liked me. And when Jerry'd show up on a job, now he's a general contractor. You know, he did the, the concrete, the steel, you, you name it, did everything. So he would want, he wanted money, he'd want his draw. So Harold would come out there and have Jerry Sonsteins come out. And then they'd take me with him, maybe walking around all the time as a little kid, I don't know how he drugged me, but they did. And I heard him one day, he, you know, Harold was wanting paid. And he goes, uh, he, he looks around, he's got a big old coat on, big Jew, you know. At that code, and he looks around and says, Harold, show me what you've done. That has never left my mind to this day. Show me what the fuck you've done. You run your mouth, what have you done? You know, everybody's, everybody's got these, like you said, they got programs and this and that. I never even heard of these people. And they all got a program. They don't go to meets. They don't put it online. So, uh, you know... That, but I'll never forget that saying. Show, I remember he said, show me what you've done. I go, where's the block? Where's the concrete? Where, you know, you, it's funny, that was stuck with me. I, that'd be 62 years. Mm -hmm. But it stuck with me. Because when people wanted to say something, I said, show me what you've done. You're in the top 10? You know, when PLUSA was out? Where's it at? Where's your name? Don't, don't tell me you've done something, you've never done it, and all this. and. I don't know. I get a little disturbed at some things, but I, basically I just try to tame my little hole. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I go to meet, and as soon as it's over, I'm out of there and back home, and that's where I want to be, back here and start training again. Get these guys going. And, you know, like a, a guy asked me one day down there, you know, they're never going to be the greatest. And he says, what do I expect? I said, progress. Just make progress. That's all I'm asking. You don't make progress, I don't know why you're here. You know, just for what the name is, T-shirt or something? I don't know. But you got to make progress. And if you don't make progress, you you know. You, you know how it is in sports. You're in a weird sport because ESPN, they'll bad mouth you one day, they'll kiss your ass the next. I'm going like, I don't, I can't stand to watch it. Like Stephen A. Smith and these guys. Well, I don't give a damn. It's, it's because, because of the news cycle, man. Like uh, the news cycle is about seven days. So people's memories are so short, their attention spans are so short that these guys have to be more polarizing every time you hear them. And that's why Stephen A. Smith acts the way he does. And like whether or not any of these guys believe any of this shit blows yeah. my mind. But it's the fact that uh, we've just become so desensitized that it's uh, usually the loudest, yappiest, biggest fucking load of bullshit is the thing that catches people's attention. And now, because there's so many different ways and different avenues in terms of projecting information, whether it be social media and phones and here, and you know, everybody's got this fucking Instagram page or you got this I mean you, you got thousands of people vying for everybody's attention so it's unfortunately like you said man the one who yells the loudest tends to the one that people tune in and, yeah. and uh you know and I unfortunately uh that's what I think people have come become used to where it's not necessarily the person that's producing results for the last five or six decades it's the person that's got the biggest gimmick or uh you know or the you know the best branding or the one that can yell the loudest or talk the most shit which is uh is funny because uh uh, I've never seen the level of shit talking and pettiness in, that I have in powerlifting and oh. the lack of support. I mean, you would think that these dudes were like arguing about purses or uh, like, I mean, like it, it, it's fucking unbelievable. Like, like I said, like that dude benches, like I, I don't give a shit. Like there's like, oh. like the difference, but like, so geared powerlifting and raw powerlifting are two different sports. Like it, it just is like you can't equate them, and like the fact that you have people that like barely bench two twenty five in the local gym shitting on a dude benching thirteen twenty two in a fucking shirt. Like, why would you think there would be 
Like it, it, it just blows my fucking mind. And maybe because I've lifted weights my whole life, so I know that even you could give me everything you want, every shirt, the fucking monolift, a crane, and still not be able to do 1322 off of that. It just blows my fucking yeah, well, mind. That's, I mean, that's like insane. That's unbelievable. Do you see that uh, guy, I think it's Israel or whatever, uh, Raw Bench 804? Yeah. Is he a is he a beast or what? Yeah, I mean, what's he four hundred plus pounds? Jesus Christ! Yeah, like a bear. Yeah, and like uh, and the the thing I love is that uh, these dudes come out of nowhere. Like the guy's been like you said, he's like a bear. He's been training in a cage somewhere, and then it comes in and does like a fucking legit eight hundred pound bench. I mean, it's unreal. People ask me which one's most impressive, and I said, I to me they're both. I mean, I can't pick one over the other. Actually, they're both insane. Yeah, I never thought it's the eight hundred pound bench press. Yeah. Roll. Well, well, I mean, uh, what's the biggest squat uh, or uh, geared it's right squat? Right over thirteen hundred. Yeah, um, Brian Carroll did like thirteen oh three five, whatever it is in kilos. Yeah, then he's done. You <laughs> know, packed it in. Well, I mean, what's uh? It, I mean, uh, Dave Hoff's still training, isn't he? Well, right now he's getting ready for WPO. And he's, I mean, he, uh, he's totaled over 3,000. I mean, he's... Oh, 3,100. 3,100. Yeah, he's so far ahead of everybody. Amazing. He's special, you know, just special. Special body, special leverage, and special brain. Yeah, he's a big dude. I mean, yeah, I saw him come in, and I was like a fucking Ram man. He's um, thick. Yeah. So what's the future for Westside Barbell? I don't know. I'm hoping to get some lectures and make some more history. So the, the, you the have, mission never changes, huh? Nope, never does. You know, you got to have racehorses to win races. And just trying to get some racehorses in here. Tom will tell you it's hard to get. Hard to, you tell me one strong guys, they got guys benching two and a quarter at 220. Oh, tell you, even, what are you doing even sending this in? I guess they think highly of themselves. I don't know. Uh, I just. Uh, my thing was always been education. You know, I was a terrible student, and then, and I've been, you know, for years. But now I realize, like I said, when I started to get bad, I had to pass what I know on, or why would I be here? The only difference between me and the Russians seemed like they retired quick for lifting, and then they became scientists. You know, they're they're scientists at thirty seven years old. Me, I went to sixty three. I didn't have time to write all those books and stuff until I really, uh, you know, sort of sat down and doing this and. I mean, I worked with set over 70 foot shot putters, you know, uh, worked with uh, Butch Reynolds, Mo Robinson, Olympic gold medals, and 400. So, a lot of people just uh, all over the place, and I've only had a few. If I had a bunch of them, you know, I was always said, what if I had a bunch of them? Because that's how you learn. You learn from a group, you don't learn from one or two guys. No, I mean, that makes total sense. Yeah. So if, uh, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of the education stuff, I mean, obviously write books, um, you know, and you guys do courses. So if people want to get more information, Westside Barbell, easy right. enough to Google it. and Just go right to Westside Barbell and Tom Barrow will take care of you. Awesome. You got anything else, Mr. McQuilkin? No, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. For everything, yeah. the time and all of you've done. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and thanks for tuning in another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Bye.